DMT, The Spirit Molecule, by Rick Strassman, M.D., published by Inner Traditions International Limited, Rochester, Vermont. Introduction In 1990, I began the first new research in the United States in over 20 years on the effects of psychedelic or hallucinogenic drugs on humans. These studies investigated the effects of N- N-dimethyltryptamine, or DMT, an extremely short-acting and powerful psychedelic. During the project's five years, I administered approximately 400 doses of DMT to 60 human volunteers. This research took place at the University of New Mexico's School of Medicine in Albuquerque, where I was tenured associate professor of psychiatry. I was drawn to DMT because of its presence in all of our bodies. I believed the source of this DMT was the mysterious pineal gland, a tiny organ situated in the center of our brains. Modern medicine knows little about this little gland's role, but it has a rich metaphysical history. Descartes, for example, believed the pineal was the seat of the soul, and both Western and Eastern mystical traditions place our highest spiritual center within its confines. I therefore wondered if excessive pineal DMT production was involved in naturally occurring psychedelic states. These might include birth, death, and near-death psychosis, and mystical experiences. Only later, when the study was well underway, did I also begin considering DMT's role in the alien abduction experience. The DMT project was founded on cutting-edge brain science, especially that which dealt with the psychopharmacology of serotonin. However, my own background, which included a decades-long relationship with the Zen Buddhist training monastery, powerfully affected how we prepared people for and supervised their drug sessions. DMT, the spirit molecule, reviews what we know about psychedelic drugs in general and DMT in particular. It then traces the DMT research project from its earliest intimations through a maze of committees and review boards to its actual performance. Although all of us believed in the potentially beneficial properties of psychedelic drugs, the studies were not intended to be therapeutic, and so our research subjects were healthy volunteers. The project generated a wealth of biological and psychological data, much of which I have already published in the scientific literature. On the other hand, I have written nearly nothing about volunteers' stories. I hope the many excerpts I have included here, taken from over 1,000 pages of my notes, will provide a sense of the remarkable emotional, psychological, and spiritual effects of this chemical. Problems inside and outside of the research environment led to the end of these studies in 1995. Despite the difficulties we encountered, I am optimistic about the possible benefits of the controlled use of psychedelic drugs. Based upon what we learned in the New Mexico research, I offer a wide-ranging vision for DMT's role in our lives and conclude by proposing a research agenda and optimal setting for future work with DMT and related drugs. The late Willis Harmon possessed one of the most discerning minds to apply itself to the field of psychedelic research. Earlier in his career, he and his colleagues administered LSD to scientists in an attempt to bolster their problem-solving skills. They found that LSD demonstrated a powerfully beneficial effect on creativity. This landmark research remains the first and only scientific project to use psychedelics to enhance the creative process. When I met Willis 30 years later in 1994, he was president of the Institute of Noetic Sciences, an organization founded by the sixth man to walk on the moon, Edgar Mitchell. Mitchell's mystical experience, stimulated by viewing Earth on his return home, inspired him to study phenomena outside the range of traditional science that nevertheless might yield to a broader application of the scientific method. During a long walk together along the central California coastal range one day, Willis said firmly, At the very least we must enlarge the discussion about psychedelics. It is in response to his request that I include in this book 
highly speculative ideas and my own personal motivations for performing this research. This approach will satisfy no one in every respect. There is intense friction between what we know intellectually or even intuitively and what we experience with the aid of DMT. As one of our volunteers exclaimed after his first high-dose session, Wow! I never expected that! Or as Dogen, a 13th-century Japanese Buddhist teacher, said, We must always be disturbed by the truth. Enthusiasts of the psychedelic drug culture may dislike my conclusion that DMT has no beneficial effects in and of itself, that, rather, the context in which people take it is at least as important. Proponents of drug control may condemn what they read as encouragement to take psychedelic drugs and a glorification of the DMT experience. Practitioners and spokespersons of traditional religions may reject the suggestion that spiritual states can be accessed and mystical information gained through drugs. Those who have undergone alien abduction and their advocates may interpret my suggestion that DMT is intimately involved in these events as a challenge to the reality of their experiences. Opponents and supporters of abortion rights may find fault with my proposal that a pineal DMT release at 49 days after conception marks the entrance of the spirit into the fetus. Brain researchers may object to the suggestion that DMT affects the brain's ability to receive information, rather than only generating those perceptions. They also may dismiss the proposal that DMT can allow our brains to perceive dark matter or parallel universes, realms of existence inhabited by conscious entities. However, if I did not describe all the ideas behind the DMT studies and the entire range of our volunteers' experiences, I would not be telling the entire tale. And without the radical proposals I offer in an attempt to understand volunteers' sessions, DMT, the spirit molecule, might have, at best, little effect on the scope of discussion about psychedelics. At worst, the book would reduce the field. Nor would I be honest if I did not share my own speculations and theories, which are based on decades of study and listening to hundreds of DMT sessions. This is why I did it. This is what happened. This is what I think about it. It is so important for us to understand consciousness. It is just as important to place psychedelic drugs in general, and DMT in particular, into a personal and cultural matrix in which we do the most good and the least harm. In such a wide open area of inquiry, it is best that we reject no ideas until we actually disprove them. It is in the interest of enlarging the discussion about psychedelic drugs that I've written DMT, The Spirit Molecule. Prologue First Sessions One morning in December 1990, I gave both Philip and Nils an injection of a large dose of intravenous DMT. These two men were the first people in the study to receive DMT and they were helping me determine the best dose and manner of injecting it. They were our human guinea pigs. Two weeks earlier I had given the very first dose of DMT to Philip. As I will describe, the intramuscular injection into his shoulder didn't give completely satisfactory results. We then switched to the intravenous route, and Nils received the drug that way for the first time a week later. Nils's reaction indicated that the dose we gave him was too low. So today, Philip and Nils were going to receive substantially higher doses of intravenous DMT. It was hard to believe we really were giving DMT to human volunteers. A two-year process of obtaining permission and funding, which I felt would never end, was finally over. Attaining the goal never seemed as likely as the continual struggle to do so. Philip and Nils both had previous experience with DMT, and I was glad they did. About a year before starting our study, they had attended a ceremony in which a Peruvian folk healer gave all participants ayahuasca, the legendary DMT-containing tea. The two men were enthusiastic about this orally active form of DMT, 
and were eager to smoke pure DMT the next day when a member of the workshop made it available. They wanted to feel its effects in a much more immediate and intense manner than the tea form allowed. Phillips and Nils's experiences smoking DMT were typical. A startlingly rapid onset of effects, a kaleidoscopic display of visual hallucinations, and a separation of consciousness from the physical body. And, most curiously, there was a feeling of the other somewhere within the hallucinatory world to which this remarkable psychedelic allowed them entrance. Their prior experience with DMT was a very important aspect of bringing them in as the first volunteers. Philip and Nils were familiar with the effects of DMT. Even more crucial, they were familiar with the effects of smoking the drug, which would help them gauge the adequacy of the two different administration methods I was considering. Intramuscular, I.M., or intravenous, I.V., and reproducing the full effects of the smoking route. Since recreational users of DMT usually smoke it, I wanted to approximate as closely as possible the effects as they occur when taken in this manner. On the day Philip received the first dose of DMT by the intramuscular route, I already was thinking ahead. Perhaps the IM method might be too slow and mild compared to smoking the drug. What I had read about IM-DMT suggested it took up to a minute to start working, substantially longer than when it was smoked. However, since all but one of the previously published human research papers on DMT reported giving it intramuscularly, I was obliged to begin this way. This older literature suggested that the dose I was to give Philip one milligram per kilogram, about 75 milligrams, probably would be a moderately high dose. Philip was 45 years old when he began participating in our research. Bespectacled, bearded, and of medium height and build, he was an internationally known clinical psychologist, psychotherapist, and workshop leader. He was soft-spoken but direct, and he elicited great affection from his friends and clients. At the time, Philip was beginning a divorce that would become especially long and difficult. His life had been marked by many deep changes, losses and gains, and he seemed to take the good and the bad with the same equanimity. He liked to say that the title of his self-help bestseller would be Surviving Your Life. At least five years had passed since I last gave an IM injection of anything to anyone, and I was nervous about administering the first dose of DMT this way. What if I missed? The last time I gave such an injection, I probably had been giving the antipsychotic drug haloperidol to an agitated patient with psychosis. These patients often had their arms and legs tied down by psychiatric orderlies or the police beforehand to make sure their disorganized and frightened behavior didn't end in violence. This also kept the patient's arms in a relatively stable position for my injection. I tried remembering the confidence with which I previously gave IM shots, since I had performed hundreds in the past. The secret was to think of the syringe as a dart. We were taught in medical school to pretend you were throwing this dart into the rounded deltoid muscle of the shoulder or the gluteus maximus muscle of the buttocks. A single, fluid motion lightening the pressure just as the needle pierced the muscle through the skin usually produced excellent results. We practiced on grapefruits. Philip, however, was neither a grapefruit nor an acutely psychotic patient delivered up to me for involuntary tranquilization. He was a professional colleague, friend, and research volunteer on equal footing with me and my staff. Philip was to be the scout. Cindy, our research nurse, and I were to remain at base camp to hear about where he went after his return. Practicing my technique in the air, I walked down the hall and entered Philip's room. Philip lay in bed. His new girlfriend, Robin, sat nearby. The cuff of a blood pressure machine was loosely wrapped around his arm. We would check his heart rate and blood pressure frequently throughout the session. I explained what was going to happen. I'll wipe your shoulder with some alcohol. Take as much time as you need to collect yourself. Then I'll inject the needle into your arm, 
draw back to make sure I'm not in a blood vessel, and then push in the plunger on the syringe. It might stink, or it might not. I don't really know. You ought to feel something in a minute or less, but I'm not sure what that something will be. You're the first. Philip closed his eyes for a moment as he prepared to venture into unknown territory, worlds only he would perceive, leaving us behind to look after his life functions. He opened his eyes widely to briefly gaze at us one more time, then closed them again, took a deep breath, and on his exhalation said, I'm ready. The injection went without a hitch. After a little more than a minute, Philip opened his eyes and began breathing deeply. He looked as if he were in an altered state of consciousness. His pupils were large, he began groaning, and the lines of his face smoothed. He closed his eyes while Robin held his hand. He lay extremely still and remained silent, eyes closed. What was happening? Was he all right? His blood pressure and heart rate seemed fine, but... What about his mind? Did we overdose him? Was he having any effect at all? About twenty-five minutes after the injection, Philip opened his eyes and looked up at Robin. Smiling, he said, I could have done more. We all breathed a sigh of relief. Fifteen minutes later, or forty minutes after the injection, Philip started speaking slowly and haltingly. I never lost touch with my body. Compared to smoking DMT, the visuals were less intense, the colors were not as deep, and the geometric patterns did not move as fast. He sought my hand for comfort. My hands were damp from nervousness, and he laughed good-naturedly at my anxiety, which was clearly greater than his. Upon arising to go to the bathroom, Philip was shaky. He drank some grape juice, ate a little container of yogurt, and filled out the rating scale. He felt spaced out, fuzzy in his mind, awkward, while we walked to and from another building where I had some business. It was important to be with him, to observe how he functioned for the next couple of hours. Philip seemed well enough three hours after his DMT shot for Robin to drive him home. We said goodbye in the hospital parking lot, and I told him to expect a call that night. When we spoke, Philip told me that Robin and he went to eat lunch after leaving the hospital. He immediately became more alert and focused. On the ride home, he felt euphoric, and colors seemed brighter everywhere he looked. He sounded quite happy. Philip sent me a written report a few days later. Most important was his last comment. I expected to jump to a higher level, to leave the body and ego consciousness, the jump into cosmic space. But this did not happen. This threshold to which Philip referred is what we now call the psychedelic threshold for DMT. You cross it when there is a separation of consciousness from the body, and psychedelic effects completely replace the mind's normal contents. There is a sense of wonder or awe, and a feeling of undeniable certainty in the reality of the experience. This clearly had not occurred with one milligram per kilogram intramuscular DMT. It was great to have Philip in this explorer's role. He was psychologically mature and stable and was familiar with the efforts of psychedelics in general and DMT in particular. He could make clear, understandable comparisons between different drugs and different ways of receiving them. His case was powerful validation of our decision to enroll only experienced psychedelic users. Philip's report left no doubt that IM DMT effects lagged behind those of smoked DMT. I considered giving a higher dose. However, even if full peak effects developed, I doubted that this route would ever give the rush that is another hallmark of smoked DMT. During this rush, which usually happens in the first 15 to 30 seconds after smoking DMT, the shift from normal consciousness to an overwhelming psychedelic reality takes place with breathtaking speed. It is this nuclear cannon effect that users find so frighteningly attractive. We definitely needed a more rapid way of getting DMT into the system. Most recreational DMT users smoke it in a pipe sprinkled on marijuana or a non-psychoactive herb. 
This is not the ideal method of getting DMT into your body. The drug often catches fire, which is disconcerting when you are trying to inhale as much of the vapor as possible. The smell of burning DMT is intensely nauseating, like that of burning plastic. As the drug takes effect and the room seems to begin breaking up into crystalline shards, your body following suit, it becomes nearly impossible to know if you are inhaling or exhaling. In that state of intoxication, imagine trying to breathe into your lungs as much of this flaming, foul-ordered blob of chemical as possible. The fastest and most efficient way to administer DMT is by injection. Intramuscular injections depend on the relatively limited blood flow through muscles to drain away the drug, and it is the slowest type of injection. Drugs also may be given into the skin or subcutaneously, where the slightly richer blood flow makes for a faster, though usually painful, method. Injection into a vein is the best method. From the intravenous or IV injection site, drug-rich blood returns to the heart. The heart pumps this blood through the lungs, from there it re-enters the heart and then makes its way out to the rest of the body, including the brain. The time for this entire process, what physiologists call arm-to-tongue time, is usually about 16 seconds. I consulted with my colleague who had made the DMT, David Nichols, Ph.D., at Purdue University in Indiana. He agreed that I needed to switch to the intravenous route. Reflecting upon our mutual anxiety about this change in plans, he added dryly, I'm glad it's you and not me. It was time to consult with Dr. W., the physician at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, FDA, who, after helping guide the project through the two-year regulatory process, was now overseeing its performance. When I asked his opinion, he laughed and said, You were the only research scientist in the world giving DMT. You're the expert. You decide. He was right, but I was nervous about entering such uncharted territory so quickly, after giving just one dose of DMT. There was only one previously published report that described giving DMT intravenously, but this was to psychiatric patients, not normal volunteers. That 1950s project studied severely impaired patients with schizophrenia, most of whom were unable to report much about their experiences. In fact, one unfortunate woman's pulse was not detectable for a short while after she received IV DMT. It was in deference to this report that I was so cautious about heart function in all prospective volunteers. Dr. W. recommended trying about one-fifth the IM dose when switching to the IV route. That will probably give you lower blood and brain levels of DMT than you produced by giving it intramuscularly, and you should have some room to maneuver, he said. You probably won't overdose anyone this way. In our case, that meant converting the IM dose of one milligram per kilogram to 0.2 milligrams per kilogram intravenous DMT. Philip and Nils both had eagerly volunteered for this new and uncharted phase of the research, finding a satisfactory dose of IV DMT in normal volunteers. Since both had smoked DMT previously, we would be able to compare directly the effects of IV to smoked drug. And in Philip's case, we could compare IV to IM routes. Nils was 36 years old when he began in our research. As a younger man, Nils had enlisted in the Army, desiring to specialize in explosives. However, he quickly saw that he was unfit for the armed services, and he applied for an early discharge for psychological reasons. Philip happened to be the psychologist who performed this evaluation on Nils, and they had remained friends afterward. Nils was keenly interested in mind-altering drugs and always was looking for a neglected plant or animal product that might produce such effects. He had written several popular pamphlets, including one announcing his discovery of the psychedelic properties of the venom of the Sonoran Desert toad. This venom contains high levels of 5-methoxy-DMT, a compound closely related to DMT. When smoked, this toad product is quite impressive. Nils was a long and lanky fellow, charming and fun to be around. 
He had taken LSD many times, having lost track after the 150th dose. The first time he had smoked DMT at Philip's house the year before, he was powerfully moved. He said, It made strong telepathic impressions, causing mental bonds with the people around me. This was confusing and overwhelming. I became very excited as an inner voice spoke to me. This was my intuition directly relating to me. It was the most intense experience of my life. I want to go back. I saw a different space with bright bands of color. I couldn't raise my hands. I tripped so hard. It is a mental mecca, an excellent reference point for all other psychedelics. Those around me looked like alien space insects. I realized they were all part of it, too. Nils received 0.2 milligrams per kilogram intravenous DMT about a week after Philip's first IM dose. My feelings were similar to those I had for Philip's injection. That is, while the actual day was a landmark, it also seemed like a dry run, a rehearsal for the real thing. It was very likely we would go beyond this dose. On the day of Nils's point two milligrams per kilogram session, I found him lying on the hospital bed in his research center room underneath his familiar army sleeping bag. He took this bag with him whenever he traveled both literally and figuratively, when he would journey on the road or when he would take a psychedelic drug trip. Cindy and I sat on either side of Nils. I gave him a brief preview of what to expect. He nodded for me to begin. Halfway through the injection, Nils said, Yes, I taste it. Nils turned out to be one of the few volunteers who could taste intravenous DMT as the drug-rich blood rushed through his mouth and tongue on the way to his brain. It was a metallic, slightly bitter taste. I thought, this seems fast enough. My notes are sketchy as to the effects of this dose of IV DMT on Nils. This may have been due to his taciturn nature, or because neither of us were especially impressed with the intensity of the experience. He did remark, however, that 0 0.2 milligrams per kilogram was maybe one-third to one-fourth the full dose relative to his experience smoking DMT. Perhaps feeling a little overconfident from how easy these first two sessions, Philip's IM and Nils's IV, had been, I decided to proceed immediately to triple Nils's IV dose from 0 0.2 to 0 0.6 milligrams per kilogram. My confidence was premature. In retrospect, a more cautious move to doubling it to 0.4 milligrams per kilogram would have been more reasonable. Thankfully, I didn't jump to 0.8 milligrams per kilogram, which would have happened had I followed Nils's suggestion that 0.2 milligrams per kilogram was a fourth of a full dose. This morning, both Philip and Nils were going to get 0.6 milligrams per kilogram IV DMT. It was sunny, cold, and windy in Albuquerque that day, and I was glad to be working inside. I entered Nils's room in the research center. He was lying under his sleeping bag, awaiting the first 0.6 milligrams per kilogram dose. Cindy already had placed a small needle into a forearm vein the portal through which I would inject the DMT solution directly into his blood. She sat on his right side and I on his left, where the tubing from the IV line dangled off his arm. Philip also was here. He was scheduled to receive the same dose later in the morning, if all went well with Nils. He sat at the foot of the bed, curious about what Nils was to experience, and ready to provide moral support for all of us. Little did we suspect we'd need him for physical backup, too. I infused the solution of DMT somewhat more quickly than I did for Nils's previous 0.2 milligrams per kilogram dose, over 30 seconds rather than a minute. I thought a faster injection might allow for less dilution of the DMT in the bloodstream. This then would generate higher peak levels of DMT in the blood and, therefore, the brain. After the infusion of drug was complete, Nils said excitedly, I can taste it. Here it is. Immediately after blurting this out, 
he began tossing and turning under his sleeping bag. He then sat up with a start, exclaiming, I'm going to vomit. He gazed at us, stunned and uncertain. Cindy and I looked at each other at the same time, realizing we had nothing into which he could throw up. We hadn't foreseen that our test subjects might need to vomit. He mumbled, But I didn't have any breakfast, so there's nothing to throw up. Nils became agitated and pulled the pillow and sleeping bag over his face. He curled into the fetal position, away from us and the blood pressure machine, kinking the tubing that connected the cuff to the unit. We could not get a reading at either two or five minutes, when we knew his blood pressure and heart rate would be at their highest and potentially most dangerous levels. He tried climbing out of the bed with a mostly purposeless flailing of his arms and legs, but this was a substantial mass of limbs in someone six foot four. His hands were cold and clammy as Cindy, Philip, and I joined forces and maneuvered him back into the now too small seeming bed. At six minutes, he retched into a basin we found in the closet. Because he had to sit up to do so, we were able to reposition him in the bed, and we obtained a blood pressure and heart rate recording. At this point, ten minutes after the injection, his readings were surprisingly normal. He reached out to Cindy, touching her arm and sweater. It looked as if he were about to stroke her hair, but quickly seemed to forget what he was going to do. Nils then stared at me, saying, I need to look at you now, not Philip or Cindy. I did my best to look calm, answering his gaze with my own, praying quietly that he would be all right. At nineteen minutes he sat up on his elbows and laughed. He looked very stoned, large pupils, lopsided grin, mumbling incoherently. He finally said, I think the best high dose is between point two and point six. We all laughed, and the tension in the room dropped a few notches. Nils still had his wits about him, at least at that moment. He continued, There was the movement of the self. I am disappointed that it's ending. It was a cafeteria of colors. A familiar feeling, yes. I've returned. They were there, and we recognized each other. I asked, who? No one or thing identifiable as such. He still seemed quite under the influence. I did not want to press him. He shook his head and added, Coming down from the high was very colorful, but it was boring compared to the peak. At the peak I knew I was back where I had been when I smoked it last year. It was a lonely feeling leaving there. I thought I had gotten really sick. I felt you hovering over me like I was dying and you all were trying to resuscitate me. I hoped everything was all right. I was just trying to catch what was happening inside. He paused, then concluded, I'm tired. I'd like to nap, but I'm not really sleepy. Nils had little to say beyond this other than that he was ravenously hungry, wisely having skipped breakfast. He ate heartily while filling out our rating scale. So even Nils thought point six milligrams per kilogram was too much. I spent a few minutes in the nurse's lounge, reflecting upon what we had just seen. From a cardiac point of view, Nils's blood pressure and heart rate had risen only moderately, although we missed the readings at their presumed peak. Thus, there seemed likely to be no physical harm from administering 0.6 milligrams per kilogram IV DMT. However, I was not sure if the thinness of Nils's report was because he could not remember what had happened, or because of his style of keeping to himself most of what had taken place. We clearly had broken through the psychedelic threshold. The suddenness and intensity of onset, the irrefutable nature of the experience, the inhabited sense Nils described all added up to a full DMT trip. But was it too far beyond the psychedelic barrier? Nils was a self-acknowledged hard head, requiring higher doses than many to attain comparable levels of altered perceptions from the same drug. How would Philip fare? Philip and I walked down the research center's brightly lit hall. 
We passed Nils at the nurse's station looking for more food. He felt great. It was reassuring to see how well he looked so quickly after his harrowing jump off the psychic cliff. I asked Philip, Are you sure you want the same dose? Yes. There was absolutely no hesitation. I was not so sure. If Philip declined undergoing an experience similar to Nils's, my anxiety would have become more tolerable. Perhaps he would settle for 0.5 or 0.4 milligrams per kilogram. This would be easy enough to do. I could simply stop short of emptying the entire syringe full of DMT solution. While I believed 0.6 milligrams per kilogram most likely was physically safe, the potentially shattering mental effects loomed in front of all of us even more dramatically than they had before Nils's session. However, Philip was not to be outdone by his friend and fellow psychonaut. He was ready for his 0.6 milligrams per kilogram dose. This tendency in our volunteers to persevere even under the possibility of an annihilating psychedelic experience was marked. It was most apparent during our tolerance study, which took place the next year, in 1991, in which volunteers received four large doses of DMT, each separated by only 30 minutes. Not one volunteer, no matter how worn out, refused that fourth and final high dose of DMT. Philip's desire to take the same dose as Nils confronted me with a scientific, personal, and ethical dilemma. My training had taught me that one should not shy away from prescribing a little too much of a medication if the circumstances called for doing so. For example, very high doses might be necessary for a full therapeutic response in otherwise treatment-resistant patients. In addition, it was important to learn about toxic effects to be able to recognize them quickly in various circumstances. This latter point is even more important when studying a new experimental drug. It was within my authority and responsibility as the principal investigator of the project to tell Philip I did not want him to repeat a Nils-like 0.6 milligrams per kilogram DMT experience. However, Nils seemed fine now. More importantly, he was the first and only person to get this dose. I had planned on 2.6 milligrams per kilogram sessions that morning so that I could determine if this dose caused similar responses in two different people. I liked Philip, and he did want his 0.6 milligrams per kilogram dose. But how much of a role did our friendship play? I didn't want to do as he requested just so that I wouldn't jeopardize our relationship, but I wanted his participation in this early stage of the study to be worth his while. He was, in some ways, doing us a favor. Philip lived far from Albuquerque, and asking him to return once more to get 0.6 milligrams per kilogram, if 0.4 or 0.5 were not a full enough dose, would have inconvenienced him. There were many competing priorities— I hoped I made the right decision by agreeing to give Philip 0.6 milligrams per kilogram. Entering his room, Philip and I said hello to Cindy and Robin, Philip's girlfriend, who were already there waiting for us. He made himself comfortable on the bed. Another 0.6 milligrams per kilogram IV DMT session was about to begin. Philip's bare and sterile room featured brightly waxed linoleum floors, salmon-pink walls and tubes for oxygen, suctioning of secretions, and water exiting from behind the bed. He had taped a poster of Avalokiteshvara, the 1,000-armed Buddhist saint of compassion, on the outside of the closed wooden bathroom door that faced his bed. A television attached by a maze of cables hung from the ceiling, looking down at his mechanized, narrow bed, which was covered with thin hospital sheets. The air conditioning hummed loudly. He lay down on the bed and made himself as comfortable as possible. Cindy smoothly and skillfully placed an intravenous line into one forearm vein. The blood pressure cuff was also wrapped around this arm. Philip's other arm had inserted into it a larger IV line from which we could draw blood, so we could measure concentrations of DMT in his blood after administering it. This line was attached to a clear plastic bag that dripped sterile salt water into the vein, 
so that there would be no clotting in the blood-drawing tube. Cindy and I sat on either side of Philip, not sure what to expect in light of Nils's earlier reaction. Robin sat off to the side, near the foot of the bed. Philip, fresh from Nils's unnerving session only an hour ago, needed little preparation. He knew what to expect from us while he was lying in his bed under the influence. He had seen that we would help him immediately if he seemed in need of assistance. We wished him luck. He closed his eyes, lay back, took some deep breaths, and said, I'm ready. I watched the second hand of the clock on the wall, waiting for it to hit the six, so that I could time the thirty-second injection to finish when the second hand hit the twelve, which would be time zero. It was nearly ten a.m., just as I finished inserting the needle of the syringe into Philip's line, but before depressing the plunger and emptying the DMT solution into Philip's vein, there was a loud, insistent knocking on the door. I looked up, paused, removed the needle from the line, capped it, and placed it on the nightstand next to Philip's bed. The director of the research center laboratory was waiting outside the door. I stepped into the hall out of earshot from the room. He said that the previous blood samples for DMT analyses were collected incorrectly, and that we needed to change how we did this. I told him we would modify our technique accordingly. I let myself back into Philip's room, and took the chair by the side of his bed once more. He seemed unaware of the interruption, having begun the inward turning and letting go that we found allows for the smoothest possible entry into the DMT realms. For him, the trip had already begun. I apologized for the interruption and, trying to lighten the mood, said, Where were we now? Philip replied with only a grunt. He opened his eyes, nodded for me to proceed, and closed them again. I uncapped the syringe and reinserted the needle into his IV tubing. Cindy nodded that she was ready, too. I said, Okay, here's the DMT. I slowly and carefully began infusing 0.6 milligrams per kilogram DMT into Philip's vein. Halfway through the injection, Philip's breath caught in his throat, sounding like a cough that never quite got out. We quickly learned that whenever this catching in the throat followed a high-dose injection, we were in for a wild ride. Quietly, I let Philip know, it's all in. Twenty-five seconds after the infusion was complete, he began groaning, I love... I love... His blood pressure rose moderately, but his heart rate jumped to 140 beats per minute, up from his resting level of 65. This increase in pulse is equivalent to that which might occur after racing up three or four flights of stairs, but in this case, Philip hadn't moved an inch. At one minute, Philip sat up looking at Cindy and me with saucer-sized eyes. His pupils were hugely dilated. His movements were automatic, jerky, puppet-like. There seemed to be no one home behind Philip's actions. He leaned toward Robin and stroked her hair. I love... I love... Twice that morning, then, a volunteer in a dazed DMT state attracted to a woman's hair. Nils to Cindy's, Philip to Robin's. Perhaps it was the most powerful image of living, organic, familiar reality available when one looked around a dreary hospital room in such a highly psychedelic state. To our relief, he lay back down without prompting or assistance. His skin was cold and clammy, as had been Nils's. His body was in a classic fight-or-flight reaction. High blood pressure and heart rate blood moving from the skin deeper into the vital internal organs, but all while he was performing almost no actual physical activity. It was difficult to draw Philip's blood. The high levels of stress hormones caused the tiny muscles lining the veins to clamp down, reducing unnecessary blood flow to the skin. At ten minutes, Philip began to sigh, How beautiful! How beautiful! Tears began streaming down his cheeks. Now that was what you would call 
a transcendent experience. I died and went to heaven. By thirty minutes after the injection, his pulse and blood pressure were normal. I was flying within a vastness. There was no relative space or size. I asked, What did you feel when your breath caught in your throat? I felt a cold, contracting feeling in my throat. It frightened me. I thought maybe I would stop breathing. The thought, let go, surrender, let go, was there for a split second. Then the rush of the drug swept even that away. Do you recall sitting up and stroking Robin's hair? I did what? Forty-five minutes after the injection, drinking tea and no longer feeling any effects of the drug, Philip could not remember sitting up, looking at us, or touching Robin. Soon thereafter, he seemed comfortable, and we were confident Robin could look after him. Philip and I spoke the following evening. He felt a little run down, but had slept very well. His dreams were more interesting than usual, although not particularly bizarre. Nevertheless, he could not remember any of them. He worked a full ten hours the next day, although not at full steam. However, he said, nobody but I would have noticed I was tired. Amazingly, these are all the notes I have from that session and the next day's report. This contrasts strikingly with Philip's usually quite eloquent descriptions of his drug sessions. Perhaps his getting through the morning safely was the most important information we needed to learn. Driving home that evening into the mountains outside of Albuquerque, I used the time to think about the day's events. I was glad that both Nils and Philip had emerged intact from their .6 milligrams per kilogram IV DMT encounters. However, I had not learned much about what their experiences were really like. Their reports were remarkably brief and lacked detail. Why were Nils's and Philip's reports so sparse? One possibility was state-specific memory. This refers to the phenomenon in which events experienced in an altered state of consciousness can be recalled clearly only upon re-entering that state, and not in the normal one. This happens under the influence of substances such as alcohol, marijuana, or prescription drugs like the sedatives Valium, Xanax, or barbiturates. It also results from non-drug-induced altered states, such as hypnosis or dreams. In Philip's and Nils's cases, this explanation would be likely if they later recalled more of their 0.6 milligrams per kilogram sessions while working with lower, more manageable doses of DMT. However, this did not occur to any extent in either man during their subsequent participation in the project. Another possibility is that Nils and Philip suffered a brief delirium, an acute organic brain syndrome, or acute confusional state. Delirium derives from the Latin de, meaning from or out of, and lira, a furrow, literally going out of the furrow or out of it. Delirium can result from physical factors such as fever, head injury, lack of oxygen, or low blood sugar. In addition, a profoundly traumatic psychological experience may produce a delirious state, such as what happens in survivors of severe trauma or disasters. I was uncertain to what degree psychological trauma contributed to Nils's and Philip's confusion in, and inability to remember much of, their DMT sessions. How much was a psychological reaction to the drug's effects, rather than a direct effect of the drug itself? That is, climbing a ladder to view a scene of unimaginable shock value might throw one into a delirious or confused state. But it is not the ladder, but rather the view the ladder provides, that is responsible. Was what Nils and Philip saw so bizarre, so incomprehensible, so utterly aberrant that their minds simply turned off to spare them from seeing clearly what was there? Maybe it was better to forget. In either case, whether too much drug or too much experience, whatever 0.6 milligrams per kilogram IV DMT did to these two seasoned psychedelic veterans, it came down to just this. Too much.
as Philip said later. It was a cosmic blowtorch, a tempest of color, bewildering, like I was thrown overboard into a storm and was spinning out of control, being tossed like a cork. I called Dave Nichols again to discuss the DMT dose. What should be a lower, high dose? A reduction to 0.5 milligrams per kilogram would be lowering the dose by only one-sixth, while 0.4 milligrams per kilogram was fully one-third less. We went back and forth. While I wanted to make certain the high dose elicited a full effect, I did not want to psychologically traumatize our volunteers. I was feeling a little tentative after the day's events with Philip and Nils. First, do no harm, is the overriding dictum for medicine in general, and even more so for human research. Creating a group of psychically damaged volunteers was not an option. Keeping the effects of Philip's and Nils's 0.6 milligrams per kilogram sessions in the forefront of our discussion, we decided to make 0.4 milligrams per kilogram the top DMT dose for the study. A few days later, I called the early DMT pioneer Dr. Stefan Sara to discuss these dosage issues. Dr. Sara had discovered the psychedelic effects of DMT by injecting it into himself in his laboratory in Budapest, Hungary, in the mid-1950s. During the first phases of human psychedelic research, it was common for the researchers themselves to go first. He now was completing a long and distinguished career at the U.S. National Institute on Drug Abuse in Washington, D.C. I asked him, Did you ever give too much DMT to your volunteers? Dr. Sara thought for a moment, then answered in his refined Eastern European accent, Yes. They could not remember anything. They could not bring back memories of the experience. The only thing that remained with them was the feeling that something frightening had happened. We did not believe it worthwhile administering those kinds of doses. It is fascinating how many of the themes that would emerge over the next five years appeared that December morning, when I administered 0.6 milligrams per kilogram IV DMT doses to Philip and Nils. We hear about near-death and spiritual experiences, and contact with them in the DMT realms. I felt conflicting priorities around friendship and research goals. The drawbacks of the hospital setting and medical model quickly were apparent. The need to give full psychedelic doses was already tempered by an awareness of their potential for negative reactions. There was a far-flung network of colleagues and regulators who variously assisted the project. All were there in some form or another in Phillips and Nils's 0.6 milligrams per kilogram IV DMT sessions. Let's now turn to the background for this research, the vast amount we know about psychedelic drugs, and the way our science and society have used that information. Then we can begin to understand the unique role DMT plays in our bodies and the astonishing functions it may serve in our lives.